Now, you ready for this? It's funny. I've been taking dope so long that I remember I used to have this disorder where it was hard for me to sleep. And I never nodded like this. It really takes just control over you after a while. It affects your walk, your feet. You will lose your job. Your home. Let me tell you something. Cats got rabies. Yeah, Matt got Amy. Shots that's ready to pop the hat like baby. Whoop. I locked the block down like a jailhouse lockdown. Cops found razors in the mattress. I let the eight poop off at your face, too. Have you coming out the speakers like the bass, too? Wayne, I feel your pain and I see your stress. How they think your people supposed to get through Katrina off a FEMA check? No coke in the Pyrex, dope in the ice, yes. Mine on the highway, both sides right left. Juel Santana went from a young prodigy to a rap legend due to his work within the legendary Harlem based rap group Dipset. He had plenty of success within the group, but his solo run left a lot more to be desired. At a point in time, he was featured on the number one record in the country. He himself had the number one rap album in the country. He also had a Nike Team USA commercial and almost dropped a collab album with arguably the best rap in the game back then with that being Lil Wayne. People actually feel like on his collaborations with Lil Wayne, they were going neck to neck. Juels dropped his last album ever at the age of 23 in 2005. That's very young, especially by rap standards. Leron James, aka Juel Santana, would be born in February of 1982 and would be raised in Harlem, New York. Growing up in Harlem would have a huge effect on Juels. In interviews, he has talked about how the drug dealers in the neighborhood shaped him. As a kid, he saw the girls, fly cars, and fancy clothes from people on the street. He aspired to have that one day, but decided to go down the wrong path to obtain those things. Juels ended up going down this path dealing drugs and things of that nature, but he never got too wrapped up into the game. He was young and wild doing these things, but something else that Juels would do when he was young was get involved in the rap game. Juels Santana started rapping in his adolescent years and will go on to form the rap duo draft pick. They would perform at the world famous Apollo Theater four times with them winning competitions three out of the four times. The crowd at the Apollo was known to be very ruthless. Joel Santana stressed in an interview with Vlad TV that a rap group winning at the Apollo three weeks in a row when he was coming up was a big deal. Before signed to a record label, the duo ended up being on unsigned hype in the Source magazine in June of 1998. Those who were around this era already know what this is, but Unsigned Hype was a column in the Source magazine that was devoted to identifying promising new rappers who did not at the time have a record deal. Notable artists that have appeared in the Unsigned Hype column are Biggie, DMX, Capone and Noriega, David Banner, and Eminem. At the time of making the Unsigned Hype column, Joel Santana was only 15, with his partner Malik only being 16. The record at the bottom of the column for people to look out for was a song called Play Rough, which featured Tracy Lee and Memphis Bleak. Gun spray in the light and plays in the night. I got dogs at 730 just waiting to bite. So play if you want. You be that nigga late in the front. After I'm done, I let my dog start shaking them up. After being on unsigned hype, the duo would end up signing two priority records. While this initially brought excitement to the two, it did not really end well. I don't know exactly when the two signed two priority, but I assume it was around 1998 to 1999. The two just simply got lost in the shuffle. At the time, Priority Records had acts like Ice Cube, Master P with No Limit Records, Black Star, Mac 10, and many, many, many more. And when I say No Limit Records, they were dropping all kinds of records in 1998 especially and had a stacked roster, especially with their newest addition being Snoop Dogg at the time. Joel Santana also has mentioned that Priority is a West Coast based label while Draft Pick were from the East Coast. 
But speaking of 1998, this is reportedly the year that Joel Santana met Cameron. How the two met was through the cousin of Joel's. Joel's cousin had been trying to get Cam to listen to Joel's, but Cam wasn't trying to hear him because Cam was with Epic Records and didn't have his situation all the way right with them. Cameron was sleeping in a car and when he woke up, Joel Santana was in the backseat of the car. Eventually, Joel's went on a rap for Cameron and he was impressed by young Joel Santana who at the time was still going by his birth name, Leron. A couple weeks after this, Cameron invited Joels to the studio, and pretty much ever since this moment, Joels has been down with Cameron. But by this time, Cam already dropped Confessions of Fire, which dropped in July of 1998. Joels would end up appearing on Cam's sophomore album SDE on the tracks All the Chickens and Double Up. SDE would release in September of 2000. While he isn't on the track My Hood from SDE, there's a video on YouTube of Joel Santana spitting a free style in 1999 during the music video shoot for the song he was around 17 in this clip when i stop dropping pop ya right. peel off in the drop with the top dropped and watch ya Woo. body shaking body aching body get out the car hit him again because he probably faking oh, you gotta wow. make sure you stay raw oh. whether you living out here or behind the state walls Woo. and i love it when y'all say the rich get richer right. all that mean to me is that the clips get bigger you know what it is hate to see me stroking your whiz come whiz. in the house i'm on the couch holding your kids got Jeez. niggas running in coke spot shoddy pumping and Boom. Every time I see this clip, I laugh at Freaky Ziki and Jim Jones. But one thing that should be noted is that according to Jim Jones, by the time Joel's got around him and Cam, he had already dropped out of high school. People like Cam and Jim Jones tried to encourage Joel's to go back to school, but they ended up putting him in an unofficial music school. This was to develop him because in their eyes, it wasn't always about partying. If Joel's did not have his stuff together, he could not go out. Out with Dipset. Not only did Joel's have to finish music, but it had to be good and meet their standards. An example of this is when Joel Santana would end up writing what would become Dipset Anthem. This would of course be years later in 2003 and Joel's was around 21 by this time. It's the same premise because Joel Santana was self-admittedly slacking around this time because he was not writing his rhymes. Cameron wanted to hear what Joel's had, but he had nothing. For three days, Joel's did not let Cam hear anything and as a result of this Cameron did not let Joel's go to an after party after a show in Chicago. While Cameron went on to the after party Joel's would write what would become his verse on Dipset Anthem. By the time Cam and the crew got back the verse was done. So that's just one example of what Cam was putting Joel's through in order to be great. But going back a little bit and in December of 2001 things would change in a major way with Cameron leaving Epic Records to join Rock of fellow records within months of him joining the label he would release an album but before that happened we would see the release of the diplomats volume one mixtape this would be our introduction to the diplomats joel santana would end up appearing on oh boy come home with me gangsta facts of life and ball out remix shortly after the release of diplomats volume one would come cameron's debut album on rockefeller which was come home with me this would release in may of 2000 too. Out of the 15 tracks on Come Home With Me, Joel Santana is on 6 of the 15. Notably, out of the 6 would come 3 classic records with those being Welcome to New York City, Oh Boy, and Hey Ma. Oh Boy would be the lead single for Come Home With Me with Joel's being a feature on the song. Oh Boy would end up peaking at number 4 on the Billboard Hot 100. This would be Joel's big introduction to the masses due to the success of the song. I've told the story behind this song a lot on my channel. The problems between Jay Z and Cam have been well documented for years and while their problems didn't start with the controversy behind Oh Boy, it definitely did not help their relationship. Besides that, essentially Joel's ended up being affected by the problems between Jay-Z and Cam due to his association with Cam. To my knowledge, Joel Santana wasn't even on Rockefeller at the time, definitely not as a solo artist. Cam would then follow up Old Boy with Hey Ma, which featured Joel's, Toya, and Freaky Ziki. Hey Ma would end up peaking at number 3 on the Billboard Hot 100. This brought even more attention to Joel's with him having another memorable verse. We also can't forget to mention Welcome to 
New York City, a classic record that Joel's would feature on and would be a one of one due to Jay and Cam's relationship. So safe to say that Joel's had a huge year in 2002. But on top of this, he had a busy year because Dipset would drop two other mixtapes, which were Diplomats Volume 2 and Diplomats Volume 3, respectively. Joel's would make appearances on these mixtapes with the majority of the tracks he's on ended up being on Dipset's debut album. But while Joel's was young and was receiving a lot of attention for what he did in 2002, something would occur that some people felt like could have possibly ended his career. On the Diplomats Volume 2 mixtape, there would be a song titled I Love You. In the original version of the song, Juels would controversially rap that he admired the courage of Muhammad Amar Atta, who was one of the people who drove a plane into the Twin Towers on 9-11. He compared the courage of Muhammad from being behind the wheel of a plane to his own courage while he was dealing drugs. This received a lot of backlash in 2002, but Juels in an interview that year would say that he did not regret the line. I feel all my diplomats are my team and I'm going to do whatever it takes for them, for my people, the same way as he did for his people. Not that I support him or what he did, but in order for him to do that, it had to take courage and love for what he believed in. A lot of New York people don't have that. Maybe if they did, something like that would not happen. Joel Santana would further say that people were willfully misinterpreting his lyrics in order to paint him as a supporter of terrorism. He would further say that he did not worship Muhammad himself but worshipped his courage. The line had nothing to do with 9-11 or Joel supporting what happened because he knew people in the towers that fell. Joel's was questioned around this time if he thought that the line would impact his career, which he felt like it would not, and he ended up being right by this. In this day and age today though, Joel's definitely would have been canceled for saying something like that 100%. In other interviews, he also said that when Diplomatic Immunity was released, he would not change the line, which was false because the line would go on to be changed. Instead of mentioning Muhammad Amar Atta on the Diplomatic Immunity version, Joel's will replace his name with the late great Muhammad Ali. Still to this day, Joel's has always stood by his controversial lyrics in the song. Also on Joel's debut album, there's a song called OK OK where he references Atta again, but his name would get censored even on the uncensored version of the song. But ultimately, like Joel's predicted, the backlash from this did not affect his career. In fact, the very next year in 2003, Vibe magazine would make a freshman class. Now a lot of us watching this video probably already know of XXL's annual freshman class where they basically say that the people who make the cover every year will be the leaders of the new school. XXL didn't start doing their freshman list until 2007, but it didn't become an annual thing until 2009. So Vibe magazine would do this four years before XXL did. However, it should be mentioned that four years prior to Vibe magazine doing this, the Source magazine would announce their version of a freshman list. Nonetheless, the class that Joel's was in was comprised of Lloyd Banks, Chingy, Joe Budden, The Game, Young Buck, YG Sella, and Joel Santana. Vibe Magazine put Lloyd Banks as the head of the class, said that Chingy was the most popular, referred to YG Sella as a child prodigy, and called Joel Santana the most mischievous. Some further information about this cover is that in Joel's profile, he's listed as 19, which is in question because he was born in 1982 and in 2003, he would have been either 20 or 21 depending on the time. But Vibe Magazine evaluated Joel's as a problem child with big time potential. Also in Joel's interview, he said that younger artists tend to be scared by letting older artists hold on to their position for so long, but he himself was gunning for these older artists' spot. Diplomatic Immunity would release in March of 2003. Joel Santana would be an absolute madman on this album, really showcasing his skills. I mean, his verses on Dipset Anthem, More Than Music, I'm Ready, Built This City, and Who I Am are examples of this. One of my favorite tracks on Diplomatic Immunity is Ground Zero. On this track, Joel Santana would rap that at the time he did his verse, his album was not done. He would further rap that he was in the middle of a bidding war, and in order for him to move in the door, he needed another $2 million on top of what he was already offered. Well, as we know, Joel Santana ended up being signed with as a group with the Diplomats to Rockefeller and Def Jam as part of Diplomat Records. We also know that he ended up signing a solo deal with the same people as well. But before dropping his debut album, Joel Santana would 
drop his debut solo mixtape, which was Final Destination. This was essentially a warm up for his album, with a couple of tracks from this mixtape going on to be included on his debut album. An example of this would be the tracks OK OK and Santana's Town. The track did not manage to chart on the Billboard Hot 100, but did manage to be nominated at the Grammys in 2004 for Best Rap Performance by a Duo or a Group. But back to Final Destination, and there are a lot of heaters on this mixtape, but one of my favorite tracks has to be the song Crack. I be dead awake, I be alive asleep, I define unique floating at its highest peak. My niggas is straight needy, they ain't greedy. What you make, they take easy. They ain't genies, they play crazy. After Final Destination comes the release of From Me To You, which is the debut album of Joel Santana. The, the album peaked at number 8 on the Billboard 200, selling 74,000 copies in its first week. In my opinion, I feel like it's a very solid debut album. There are some songs I don't really care for, but my favorite tracks on the album have to be The Champ Is Here, One Day I Smile, OK OK, Why, Monster Music, and Santana's Town. Little did we know that this would be one of the two albums that Joel's would ever release. Definitely stay tuned because this is only part one of this three part video. 2004 would end up being a huge change in Juelz's career. In 2004, Jay-Z, Dame Dash, and Kareem Biggs Burks, who co-founded the label, sold their remaining 50% stake in Rockefeller Records to his parent label, Island Def Jam. The trio originally sold a 50% stake in their company to Island Def Jam in 1997, so they just sold the rest that they had. As a result of this, Jay-Z ended up being announced as the president and CEO of Def Jam Records. As part of the deal, Jay-Z would continue to run Rockefeller. Now how exactly the split happened has been debated. What we do know is that Cameron ended up signing with Dame Dash and would no longer be on Rockefeller Records after the release of his album Purple Haze. Jim Jones would be on Koch Records and Cameron after the split would end up going to Asylum Records. Jewels would ultimately stay with Def Jam Records. The reason why is that according to him, he still wanted the major machine behind him. Not much music came from Jewels this year outside of him making multiple appearances on Jim Jones' album On My Way to Church. Notably, he would appear on the tracks Crunk Music and Only One Way Up. Those are the standouts to me at least. Aside from that, he did release the first single for his sophomore album. The single was Mic Check, which was released in December of 2004. The single would not chart on the Billboard Hot 100, but however, 2005 ended up being a huge year in his career. In June of 2005, Jewels would release Back Like Cook Crack Parts 1 and 2. Both of these tapes are pure heat. Jewels was on another level at this time. Out of the two parts, there are a lot of good tracks, but there is one that really stands out to me. It's the track Yup Yup on Part 2. In this track, Jewels raps about his debut album and he would say, and last album, they don't like me to tell this. They undershit my record, they ain't expect me to sell shit. Shut up, that's what they telling me. Switch up your melody. You hot, but if you go pop, your record will be selling three. Fuck off, I ain't no damn puppet. I'ma do what I wanna do, just as long as my fans love it. And if that can't cut it, fuck it, drop me, watch me, blow up on another label, I'm cop. This is what Jewel's claimed happened to his first album. But before we would see the release of his sophomore album, Jewel Santana would feature on a song that would all pun intended run the Billboard Hot 100 chart. He would feature on Chris Brown's debut single, Run It. This song would be huge with it going on atop the Billboard Hot 100. Chris Brown personally selected Joel Santana to be on the record. Definitely a timeless record and classic record 100%. It took time for the record to catch fire, but right when it was starting to catch fire, Joel Santana would release There It Go, which was the second single for his sophomore album. This single would be big for Joel's with it going on a peak at number 6 on the Billboard Hot 100. This would be the first time that Joel's charted on the Billboard Hot 100 as a lead artist and would be his highest charting song as a lead artist to this date as well. Finally, in November of 2005, Joel's would release his sophomore album What The Game's Been Missing. It charted one spot lower on the Billboard 200 than his debut album but sold more copies than it first week. What The Game's Been Missing ended up peaking at number 9 on the Billboard 200 charts 
charts, selling 141,000 copies in its first week. The single There It Go and the album would go on to go gold by the RIAA. Nearly every track is a banger with my favorites being Shyla's, Rumble Young Man Rumble, Lil Boy Fresh, Murder Murder, Mike Check, and Oh Yes. It makes you wonder what Joel's could have came up with to follow this up, but as of today, Joel Santana has never followed up this album. The only project that he would drop in 2006 would be Back Like Cook Crack Part 3 Fiend Out. This project has one of my favorite songs by Joel's, which is Comeback. I went from a whole grind to a slow grind. A slow grind is no grind, and no grind is slow time. But I know mine, so I coach mine. I'm right back in no time. With hard rock is showtime. I never lose my ability to hustle, the thrill in me to hustle, it's just in me to hustle, it's all in me to hustle, and calling me to hustle like while we're on 2006, I know that a lot of people are going to comment about I Can't Feel My Face, which is the collab project between Lil Wayne and Joel Santana. Well, I'm happy to tell you that I already have a whole video on that, so if you want to know more, I'll put a link in the description for you guys. But after 2006, we enter into an interesting part of Joel's career. Dipset was falling apart and tensions were rising in the group. It just sort of seemed like everybody had differences with each other. Cameron was beefing with 50 Cent at the time and Jim Jones along with Joel Santana would infamously join 50 Cent on stage during this beef which greatly upset Cameron. Joel Santana has explained that he was simply just supporting his brother Jim Jones. In 2008, it was reported that Cameron sold Joel's contract to Dev Jam for $2 million. So now Joel Santana was strictly under Dev Jam and wasn't tied to Diplomat Records as a solo artist. Joel's didn't have any hard feelings on the surface about this and thanked Cam for giving him an opportunity. He did say that he was loyal to Cam, which he took advantage of. Now with Dipset being in disarray, Juels managed to form his own group, which was Skull Gang. Unfortunately for him, the group never took off. On his own, Juels had some success, and we can look at the song Pop Champagne as an example. That song will peak at number 22 on the Billboard Hot 100. 2008 would also be the year that Juels would start to talk about an album that he was working on at the time, titled Born to Lose, Built to Win. There ended up being multiple singles released for this unreleased album with the most well-known being Back to the Crib featuring Chris Brown. Chris and Joel's had been tight since running. The last time that they collaborated, their record went number one on the charts for five weeks. This time around when they collaborated, things were a lot different. We all know what happened between Chris Brown and Rihanna in 2009, so I'm not going to get too deep into that. But Joel's never turned his back on Chris and wanted him to be on the record. Things were cool at first, but then it was suggested to Joel's that he should get Trey songs to be on the record instead of Chris Brown. What a replacement, especially looking at what's all going on with Trey songs right now. But Joel Santana didn't like this because he did not want to do Chris Brown like that. Joel Santana ended up getting his way, but he felt like L.A. Reid, the at the time chairman of Dev Jam, dropped the ball with the record with it failing the chart on the Billboard Hot 100. The last big song that Joel's would ever have is when he featured on Lloyd Banks' song Beamer, Benz, or Bentley. After this, I mean Joel's kept teasing the Born to Lose, Built to Win album and mixtapes that also would never come out. Tragedy would strike in 2011 when Joel Santana's studio in New Jersey would be raided. According to Joel's, when police returned his property back to him, his hard drives were erased. He lost over 100 songs because of this. It makes it even worse because Joel Santana also says that he does not write. Freaky Ziggy would go on to say that the raid ended up killing Dipset's deal with Interscope. The group was trying to get a deal with Interscope, but all the things that went on with the raid and losing all that music put Joel Santana into a depression. Further about this, Freaky Ziki would say, I don't know, Joel Santana had, I guess, personal problems that was negating him from hitting the studio hard. I don't know what they are or what they was, but his mind was with it. Because every time we talked to him or spoke to him, he was excited. But whatever was lurking in his personal life or whatever the case may be would basically stop him from getting into that studio. Cops took everything from Joel's studio, every single thing. They gutted it. It was back-to-back -back things going on. They're talking about some gun problems and his man died in the studio. It was just piling up on him. Joel Santana did end up dropping a mixtape titled God Willing in 2013, but that's been pretty much it as far as him releasing music. I know that after that, he did go on to release a few more things, and as of now, he is working on some new stuff, reportedly. But altogether, he's had a pretty interesting career. By the way, I'm not really getting into his personal life in this video, since that's not what this is about. In the last part of the video, I will discuss the legacy of Joel Santana.
Like I said, Joels has had a pretty interesting career. He's 100% a legend due to him being a part of the legendary group Dipset. The movement they had and their influence is something that has already gone down in the history books. I don't think that anyone is disputing that no matter how you cut it. What some people do pick holes at is the solo career of Joel Santana. People mainly feel like Joels could have gone a lot further and could have even been a superstar if he played his cards right. I did a poll on my channel where I asked my audience if Joels wasted his potential and overwhelmingly people voted yes that he wasted his potential. Before Dipset was having their own problems, Joels was dropping albums and mixtapes while being consistent. According to Joels, he refused to release music until he got off of Diplomat Records, so this is one of the reasons why we can look at him not dropping music. After he got off of Diplomat Records, he started his own thing, but that went absolutely nowhere. Joel Santana being the leader of a group never worked out. People point at Joel's being lazy and content with that amount of success that he had at that point as to why he never went further as a solo artist. While some people think this, I think that there are other factors that people don't acknowledge. The raid is something that heavily affected Joel's both personally and professionally. You mix that in with the problems with Dipset and him waiting on projects to drop. That's another thing because I Can't Fill My Face with Lil Wayne is still unreleased to this day. Can't forget to mention that Joel's was also trying to drop a collab project with Young Jeezy around that time as well. At the same time, Joel's has taken accountability for not releasing music when the time was right. Another reason people blame for Joel Santana falling off is drugs, but I respectfully don't want to get too in depth with that topic in my videos out of respect for these artists. That has already been well documented in Joel's music and in interviews by him, so it's by no surprise. It's truly sad to see what happened to him, but I firmly believe that everything happens for a reason. Sometimes in life, things just weren't meant to be. Despite all of this, Joel still holds a place in rap history for his contributions with Dipset. Sometimes you have to look at things and be glad that they happened and that's why i'm here today to tell you this story odds are if you're watching this video you were drawn in by joel santana at one point in your life but all in all let me know what you guys thought of the video i love you guys with all my heart peace